أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين والحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم مجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We then begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful used to begin many of his by advising us, Usikum ibadallah bi taqwallah. That I advise you, servants of God, to be God conscious, God fearing, and pious human beings. I pray all of you are well and that your fasts are going well inshallah. And we also pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that He give us the strength to remain in His obedience in these last few days of this holy month inshallah. Amen. And that He allow us the ability to leave this holy month as better human beings than we entered it inshallah. In this month, we said we have been focusing on the commentary or a brief commentary rather of Surah Al Ankabut, uh, the chapter we read in the, on the night of Qadr. And we've discussed three particular themes so far one having to do with tests and how this world is a world of tests. And so, if we come in there with that mindset, then we focus on how we are to pass these tests. The second focus was that of our parents. And we looked at the responsibility that we have to our parents, be they alive or not alive. And the subsequent responsibility of the parents upon the child to not make that child turn out to be disobedient because they are too demanding. And then the third aspect we talked about last week was regarding the challenges that different prophets faced and how God describes them in this particular surah. We look at one more theme and of course, these are not an exhaustive list, but we've just picked four themes to discuss over these four weeks. The next theme we will be discussing from the Surah of Ankabut is the importance of establishing our Salah. Allah Azza wa Jal in verse 45 of this Surah says, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka min al kitab. That recite, O Prophet, what has been revealed to you in this book. Wa aqim is Salah. And establish your salah. Inna salata tanha. Ahsantum anil fahshai wal munkar. Indeed, salah prevents immoralities and wrongdoings. The idea in this verse in particular 
is something that is very important for us to understand. We have, as believers, been praying our entire lives. Yeah? <laughs> Young children, we teach them how to pray from the age of five or six at the madrasa. I'm sure parents do the same in their homes. And so when you look at the totality of how long we've been praying, um, it's been a lifetime, regardless of the age, you know. And subhanAllah that if we did anything in life, as long as we've been praying, we would be masters of that particular thing. You know what I mean? Like if I had been going to the gym for 55 years, I'd be swole right now, you know. If I was cooking for 55 years, I'd be a master chef right now. The question is, am I a master servant of God after having prayed to Him for 55 years, right? And that is where we understand that even though this has been something we have been doing for so long, it hasn't necessarily produced the effect that it should have produced in our lives. And I think we can be, I can't obviously generalize and say all, but I say that if we were to be honest with ourselves, we would see that this Salah, for many of us, has not produced the same effect as it should. In this verse, Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar That salah should prevent you. Just the mere recitation of salah should prevent you from doing haram things or immoral things. Yeah, I'm, I talk about people all the time. Yeah, I cause fights, I argue, I, I do all of these things which in the sphere of akhlaq are immoral. And you wonder why has this salah not had that effect? We recite this salah five times a day saying Qurbatan ilallah, seeking the closeness to God. Am I really close to God? Yeah. Am I really obedient to God? Do I do what God wants me to do? Right? So how come it hasn't produced that qurb, that closeness to God? Salah should produce humility, knowing in front of whom we are standing. Has it produced that humility? And so there are many different effects that salah should have. And the question is that why hasn't Salah raised or produced those effects? And one of the reasons why the Qur'an tells us and the reasons it becomes very clear when we read the verses of Qur'an is that throughout our lives we have prayed Salah but we have not established our Salah. Yeah, we have not made Salah a fundamental point in our lives from which everything else circulates, from which everything else revolves. Rather, we put Salah wherever Salah fits in. When we look at the Qur'an, this is a point that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in different ways, but He never tells us in the Qur'an to pray. Never does Allah command us in the Qur'an to pray. He always commands us to establish our prayer. And there's a big difference between Him saying Salli or Sallu and Him saying Aqim as Salah yeah? or Yuqimun as Salah or Aqimus Salah, that establish your prayer. This Iqamat is Salah means make prayer established part of your lives. Every time you look at the Qur'an, you will find this to be true. For example, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Wa Aqimis Salah, Inna Salata Tanha Anil Fahshai Wal Munkar. Establish your prayer, for it should produce or save you from indecencies. In another verse in Surah Al Hud, verse 114, Allah Azza wa Jal again says, Wa aqimis salah tarafayin nahar wa zulafan min al layl. That establish your salah at the two ends of the day and at the approach of the night. In another verse, Allah says, Wa ladina sabaru btiga awaji rabbim. And for those who are patient, yeah, um, at the countenance, seeking the countenance of their Lord, wa aqamus salah. And they establish their salah. وَأَنْفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيًا And they spend in secret and publicly from what I have given them. أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ أُقْبَدَّار It is they who will be successful in the hereafter. And so the idea that is important for us to understand is that not only should we be praying, but am I praying it the way God wants me to pray it? Right? To add the value. You know, the, 
There are two branches to this thing that is very important for us to understand. There is a branch of jurisprudential law, right? Jurisprudential law, fiqh law, basically. So I know taharat rules, I know how to do wudu, I know my makharij, I know how to do takbir, I know how to do ruku. Man, I even know that if I make a mistake, how do I fix my salah? You know, shakyat the salah is not easy to know, right? But let, I'm good at all of these things. And I think that because I'm good at all of these things, that means it translates to being good in my prayer. It doesn't, right? That's one branch. The second branch is now practically put that into practice so that I can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do I connect to God, right? And that part of it is not often focused on because that's a very personal thing. Right? We can talk about remember God, we can talk about glorify God, we can talk about know God. But you have to put that work in yourself and that's honest to God work. Yeah? The jurisprudential part we teach in the madrasa, you can open a book and you learn. But the second part has to be put into practice. And so I want to very quickly just give five things that we can do. Um, of how we can establish our salah and these are just introduction steps but again like I just said we can talk about this but you will have to implement this in your life to see that you can establish the prayer. The first is we have to carve out time for our worship yeah? and what that means is that when I pray I in my mind and in my heart and even in my physical life set that time only for God. That means I carve it out, you know. There are things that we do in our life that are carved out. For example, I carve out time to go to the gym. I carve out time, for example, to come to mosque. I carve out time for school. I carve out nine days of my, nine hours of my day for work. Yeah, these are carved out times. For me to be able to connect to Allah, I have to carve out that time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means mentally I know every day, awal waqt, is whenever possible obviously, I'm not doing anything else at that prime time except that I'm worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I carve out that time and I put that time especially for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can practically do that as we've said by setting up alarms on your phone. You can put a carved out time on Google Calendar or any calendar that you use that this time is for God. So that when somebody else asks for that time from you, you can say, no, that time has already been reserved for somebody else. It is carved out for God. Right? And so the first way I make sure that I'm engaged with God is to let Him know I prioritize Him. I don't just squeeze Him in when I have time. I don't just pray when it's convenient for me to pray. No, I change everything so that I can pray to Him on time. Right? That's number one, carve out time. The second point is that it accompanies the, the carving out time. I have to have an unoccupied heart when I pray to God. The unoccupied heart means that I'm not, while I am praying, thinking about my meeting that's coming up in half an hour. That while I'm praying, I'm not thinking about what are we going to have for dinner. While I'm praying, I'm not thinking about what's for iftar, right? I have an unoccupied heart that is only for God. Now how do we develop that, right? Like that's a discussion on its own. But that's why I said it's linked to carving out time for God. If I can carve out time for God, then when a thought comes into my mind at that time, I can say, this is not your time, this is God's time. Right? I have carved out time and that carved out time gives me an unoccupied heart for God. The same way if I'm having a meeting with somebody else, I won't accept a second meeting at that time. This is their time. Right? This is my client's time. Same way I have to give that time to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to help us in that, to have an unoccupied heart, one of the things that we have to do while we're praying is we have to watch where our thoughts are going. Yeah? So you know sometimes there are so many things that we have to do. You know, We have to know what we're saying which we'll talk about. I have to focus on my recital. 
But at the same time, I have to focus on my thoughts. And so how do I do all of that? Well, you have a priority list, you know. If I know my thoughts wander in prayer, then the first thing I focus on is my thoughts, right? And so I'm reciting, and I'm not necessarily focusing on what I'm reciting, but I'm focusing on where my thoughts go. And so as soon as a thought starts to wander, I bring it back. I bring it back. And after a while, if you train it long enough, the thought learns to sit quiet and still. Yeah? It's just like any animal you train, any child you train, any human being you train. You can train your thoughts, right? but you have to be mindful over it. And the more you are mindful, the thought just stays. Try it. It will work, inshallah. The next point is that before we start our prayer, and this is something we do before and throughout, just remind yourself in front of whom you are standing. Yeah? This is such a simple tool, but it's an amazing hack, I tell you. Anytime your thoughts begin to wander, just tell yourself, Hey, do you know in front of whom you're standing? Bring it back. And keep repeating that. Know in front of whom you're standing. It keeps you focused, grounded, and centered at that point. And the more you repeat it, the more it becomes part of it. The next point is, know what you are saying. Right? That will help you as well. So when you're reciting the Arabic, translating it in your head is a great tool to stay connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last point is that we have to accept our neediness of God. You know, when, when we have something pressing, you know, for example, let's say my, my daughter had a medical exam or something she had to go through. My dua at that moment, super sincere. Yeah, super sincere. Why? Because it's a big thing for me. And so I'll pray to you very good, Ya Allah. Yeah, very well. But then in other times I've taken it for granted. And so I'm just praying like it's not a big deal. It should always be a big deal to talk to God. Always be a big deal. Because He's that important. And so I learned to, to create this neediness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These five things, carving out time, have an unoccupied heart, remind myself in front of whom I'm praying, know what I'm saying, and accept my neediness. If we can learn to do these five things consistently, it will improve my heart in salah. It will add the sweetness in my prayer. And inshallah, I will be considered amongst those who established their salah. Wa akhiru da'wan. Anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَلَعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعْمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على سيد الوصيين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين على محمد وعلى محمد وصل على سبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة.
صلی علی محمد و آل محمد و صلی علی علی ابن الحسین و محمد ابن علی و جعفر ابن محمد و موسی ابن جعفر و علی ابن موسی و محمد ابن علی و علی ابن محمد و الحسن ابن علی و الحجت القائم المهدی اللہم صلی علی محمد و صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Today is the last Friday of this holy month of Ramadan A month that went by extremely fast We pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that our fasts are accepted inshaAllah And that we get an opportunity to, to see this great month once again, insha'Allah. It is reported there's a specific dua that is recommended on this day and we've been doing it for the last many years. We recite it together. The narration is by Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari who says that I entered into the presence of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family on the last Friday of the month of Ramadan. And when the Prophet saw me, he said, Ya Jabir, Hada Akhir Jumu'ati min Shahri Ramadan for what Dehu. The Jabir, this is the last Friday of the month of Ramadan and therefore wish it and, and wish it off basically. And he then gives a dua. In this dua, I will translate for you so that you know what we are reciting. He said, Oh Allah, please do not make this the last of our fasting to you. But if you decide so, then please make me enjoy your mercy and do not make me deprived of your mercy. And then he says, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ قَالَ ذَلِكَ and Whoever recites this small dua, they will either get one of two things. إِمَّا بِبُلُوغِ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ مِنْ قَابِلْ وَإِمَّا بِغُفْرَانِ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَتِهِ That either they will be given the blessing of seeing the month of Ramadan the following year or they will be enveloped in the forgiveness and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we will recite this dua together. Repeat after me, insha'Allah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Man, we've been getting this wrong every year. Yeah? Have a repeat after me, insha'Allah. Yeah? A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم لا تجعله آخر الأهد من سيامنا إياه فإن جعلته فاجعلني مرحوما ولا تجعلني محروما صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على Today is also marked as the day of Quds a day of remembrance of the suffering and the plight of the people of Palestine a day that was established by Marhum Ayatollah Khomeini after the 1979 revolution with the intention in mind to unite the Muslim Ummah over a particular cause that was worthy of their attention and that was the liberation of the people of Palestine and their safety and them not being under occupation. We can extend this, the importance of this day to causes throughout the world where people are suffering at the hands of others, be it locally or abroad, where there is a occupation of the mind or the heart or the soul or even an emotional occupation that may be happening in a home. We seek liberation of all people from all types of intimidation and oppression, insha'Allah. 
especially when we look at what is happening in Palestine in all ways, but this last six months in particular have been very difficult for the heart and the mind and the soul to accept. You know, when you look at what's happening on the ground, if this was most any other nation that was oppressing another people, yeah, there would have been sanctions on that nation, if not military uh, attack and, and some type of occupation of that nation. But we see how there are two sides to this world and you're either with the haves or you're with the have-nots. Um, and sadly, the, the silence of the majority of the Muslim world, the silence of the superpowers when it comes to the acts of this particular nation, Israel, the arming of this nation, the continuous provision of, of weaponry, of intelligence, all of these things, you know, it's, it will not go unchecked by God, right? And this is something, you know, subhanAllah, that the, the whole chapter of Ankabut is based on this notion, isn't it? Where Allah Azza wa Jal gives us a very important rule in Surah Al-Ankabut, the chapter of the spider, where he says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَوْلِيَا The example of those who have taken other than Allah as their allies. And this is what we see. Yeah. Yeah? Taking Allah as an ally means that I stand for the truth. I stand for justice. I am not, will I am not afraid to call out even my own family when they are oppressors. But the moment I side with them in their oppression over what God wants, I have selected an ally other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah azza wa jal says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَوْلِيَا كَمَثَلِ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ The example of them is that of a spider. اتَّخَذَتْ بَيْتَ Who has taken a home for itself. وَإِنَّ أَوْهَنَ الْبُيُوتِ لَبَيْتَ بَيْتُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ And the weakest of homes is the home of a spider. Yeah? If they only knew. What, is a, what a beautiful analogy God gives. You know? um, where you see, for example, you know, that these allies, these relationships, right, that we see in our world today that, that seem unbreakable, that seem unshakable, you know. But yet in the eyes of God, this is nothing. It's like the home of a spider. You blow on it with a big wind, it will break, you know. Um, and He's proved it to us. He's proven it to us, you know. And, and it continues to get proven. Day by day, it gets proven. I know that I've shared this with you many times, but Sometimes, you know, as I said, in the darkest hours of the night, shaitan likes to have conversations with me, you know. And one of the conversations that shaitan has had is with, do you think that God can change this system? Look at the world that we live in. Look at the allegiances. Look at the powers. Look at all of these things. How can, like, I can't have any effect. How will God do anything? And then, subhanAllah, coronavirus happened, you know. And God just, I think maybe, I don't know, He was sending a lesson to us that, man, I'm powerful, don't forget about my power, you know. It's been, you know, like, it's been what, a few thousand years since we've seen the adab of God, and so we've, we've forgotten how powerful God truly is, you know. When God has described us in the Holy Qur'an, how He has destroyed nations who have disobeyed, you know. But these are thoughts that come into our minds, well, that was a particular nation, this is the entire world now we're talking about. But then God shows us how truly powerful He is. And what we also see is the beginning of the destruction of, of the state of, of Israel and those who ally themselves with it, you know. We see the destruction from within where their own people are calling for an election now. They're tired of what's taking place. They want the hostages to be returned naturally back to them. And so we see internal chaos. And whenever chaos starts on the inside, it will rot everything on the outside as well. And so that's a sign in itself. But also another sign is that the world's opinions are changing. And, and it's changing, subhanAllah, you know, that... Again, it's, it's, it's frustrating and maddening, you know, it's, it, it angers. But 
31,000 Palestinians were killed, people didn't say anything. Seven European aid workers were killed and the world is in uproar, you know, uproar. And may they serve as, as, as martyrs in this cause, because we needed that, you know. And I say that with humility, you know. They died for a greater cause and you can see that in the words of their own parents. Their own parents have come out with such harsh criticism of Israel. And you would think that somebody from Quebec wouldn't have such statements to say about the Israeli government. But they have, and the mindset is changing. I'm telling you, it's changing, right? And this is how God shows us His power. We just have to persevere. We just have to continue in dua, in raising our voices, in talking to our elected officials, and not resting when it comes to wanting this change in our hearts and demanding it anywhere we can. And eventually, inshallah, that liberation that we've been praying for will come to every single human being of every country and of every place where they will not suffer at the hands of others, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahadun illahu samad. لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد صدق الله العلي العظيم